so um, good uh, morning, afternoon, everybody. It's a true pleasure to introduce Hashem El Serag. Before I go through his CV, I, or when I went through his, his CV and thought about this, I realized that we both know each other much longer than he actually thinks. It's just that he didn't know me. When I started working in immunology of HCC, I always used his introductory slides. In the early 2000s, he published on diabetes and HCC. And, um, and you know, I was using his slides in my talks and I was doing, working in immunotherapy. The only problem is I was publishing in the journal of Never to be Read and he published in the New England Journal, Gastroenterology, um, et cetera. So, you know, with this, again, it's a true pleasure to introduce him. He's very well known in the field. Um, he started initially, uh, uh, obtained his medical degree um, in Libya and then went to the United States, uh, completed internship and residency at Greenwich Hospital, then went to Yale and uh, um, to the University of New Mexico, Albuquerque. And then um, in 1999, he joined um, Michael DeBakey's VA Medical Center at Baylor in Houston, where he has been since then and um, he has since then published more than 500, 575 papers um, in, in the field of HCC and, 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 and other GI diseases in the most um, leading journals. He is president or past president of the American um, uh, Gastroenterology Association. He's been selected member of the American Society of Clinical Investigators and American Association of Physicians. I don't want to take any more um, of everybody's time, and I'm super excited to um, listen to his talk on changing epidemiology of HCC. This title he could have given in 2004, and it hasn't changed since then, but the data obviously is very, very new and even more exciting. Thank you very much, Tim, Dr. Gretton, and thank you for inviting me uh, to uh, give a talk. Uh, I've been meeting with, you know, old friends and renewing hopefully with, with, with newer friends. Uh, so yes, uh, this is changing epidemiology of HCC. And unlike most of the talks that I've given over the past uh, uh, 25 years or so, um, I'm starting to my presentations with an anticlimactic slide. Uh, so the uh, incidence of hepatocellular carcinoma uh, in the U.S. Uh, have actually started declining. Um, so uh, this paper is no longer in review. It is published in clinical gastroenterology and hepatology, and it shows uh, probably around 2015 to 2018 uh, a decline in the age-adjusted incidence rate of HCC uh, in all ethnic groups. Uh, you see it here in Latinos, uh, Asian Pacific, uh, non-Hispanic Black, and perhaps to a lower extent in non-Hispanic whites. I'm not showing more slides about this, but it but it did affect uh, younger generations mostly. It did affect uh, the so-called uh, hepatitis C birth cohort, uh, as you might expect. So uh, what you can see also from this graph is what I spent the first 25 years talking about, which is uh, starting, uh, well, this graph starts 1992, but it probably 1985, uh, HCC have been going up and going up and going up in, in all groups. And at some point, Hispanics, which is, you know, at the top of, of, uh, of this graph, it's the triangle. Uh, Hispanics have uh, become the leading uh, ethnic group uh, with HCC overtaking the very top line, which is Asian Pacific Islanders. This is the group traditionally most affected. It's been sort of hovering along and now declined. Uh, African-Americans is number three, uh, again, disproportionately affected by the increase, but just like the other uh, groups have started declining. Uh, so this story uh, not, is not a US story only. If you look at the global incidence of liver cancer is also declining. Um, and this is shown for men and women. There are three time periods, 02, 12, and 18, and uh, it's declining particularly in men. Um, I don't wanna complicate it too much. The absolute number, the frequency of liver cancer is going way high because there's simply way more people living around the globe. 
So if you're a physician or a provider or a frontline person, uh, this idea of a dropping incidence is not going to register because you're actually seeing more people with liver cancer. And this is what, what, what I meant here. Uh, so the incidence is declining, which, which is in the yellow. It's going negative. Uh, but two things are going up, uh, growth of the population and aging of the population. And that uh, in combo uh, results in more numbers. So uh, I'm glad you gave me that uh, historical reference of uh, a long time ago, because uh, I want to start a long time ago before I go to the changing epidemiology. So in 1998, uh, I was a fellow. There are a few inventions happening around the world. One of them is the World Wide Web. Uh, at the time, I never accessed it. And when I was in New Mexico, which was also mentioned in the introduction, they have a SEER registry, and they had this amazing invention called CD-ROM. Um, and then my mentor, who was ahead of the curve, thought instead of me worrying about liver or anything, just learn SAS programming. Uh, so I started programming the national VA data sets. And in a beautiful sort of confluence of coincidence and training, uh, a resident comes who knows what the internet means. I go to a weekend course and get the CD-ROM, and I've already been training on the SAS essentials. And I was looking for a project to do that no one has done. And no one has talked about liver cancer for at least 20 years. So I thought this would be a good project for my master's in public health. Let's plot hospitalizations using the VA, incidents using SEER, mortality using the web, and there you go. So we sent it, three graphs, both say, all three graphs saying the same thing. Uh, the incidence of hepatocellular carcinoma was rising in the US, and that was my essentially first independent paper, lucked out in a, in a big way, and I thought it was easy. So uh, a few years later, I just updated the trends, and called them the continuing increase in the incidence of hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, the impact dropped. Now we're in the annals of internal medicine. A few more years, I thought it was really easy. Come up with a third installment. And at that point, we have just worried about the titles. So we called it the unbelievable rise in the incidence. No, I'm just kidding. Obviously, there was no third installment. And, and then it went on until the decline that I just mentioned. So I'm taking you back to 1999. Hepatitis C was the dominant cause of liver cancer, although hepatitis C was relatively new and we've done several studies linking it to HCC, et cetera, but hep C was the biggie and uh, most of the cancer would develop in patients with cirrhosis. So um, we would spend, well, there were NIH dedicated conferences uh, to discuss uh, what are the factors that would lead few people with hepatitis C develop liver cancer or HCC? And there were much more elaborate slides that would extend for a couple of days talking about what are the modifiable risk factors, what are the non-modifiable risk factors, what are the viral type, da, 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 da. Uh, Well, the epidemiology of HCC in HCV has changed a lot got simplified completely. It's only one factor now, practically one factor. Uh, have people been detected, treated, and received SVR or not? In those who have been detected, treated, have SVR, except for the presence of cirrhosis at baseline, none of this previous epi is influential anymore. So uh, this is one of many studies that examine the incidence of HCC on the y-axis um, stratified by receiving treatment and obtaining SVR or not. And as you can see, the blue line is considerably lower than the red line. Thus, from this study and 100 others, uh, achieving SVR in those with active hepatitis C has a dramatic and considerable reduction in the risk of HCC subsequently. You also notice that the blue line has not dropped to zero. So there is some residual risk. And the most seems to be the most determining factor for that residual risk is the presence of cirrhosis 
So in those who had cirrhosis at the time of the treatment and cure, and this is shown uh, in the red part of the slide, the overall risk is, is still significantly high, 1.8% per year, which is high, uh, high to an extent that clinical guidelines would still recommend surveillance for HCC in this group. But to my earlier point, those without cirrhosis, once they're cured, uh, nothing makes a difference. It's all low. Uh, the old factors of age and race and diabetes and alcohol, drugs, blah, 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 it doesn't matter. It's all low. Okay? Um, so uh, people have come up now with uh, stratification schemes for the risk of HCC following cure of HCV. And most of these stratification uh, schemes are dominated uh, by the first two entries here, which is cirrhosis and SVR, uh, or surrogates of cirrhosis and SVR, which is albumin, AST, ALT, uh, platelet count. So uh, to the degree uh, that I think from a clinical issue, the epi of HCC and in, in HCV uh, has been reduced really uh, to measuring and monitoring the degree of fibrosis. Uh, you know, Tim and others and many people have looked at those beautiful things related to um, uh, the immune system and, and some irreversible changes in immunity following HCV eradication. And these, uh, uh, you know, imprinted genes that left their mark uh, and, and they may still play a role, but it's very difficult to isolate those roles in the presence or absence of uh, cirrhosis. Uh, so, the whole story about HCV, HCC, if you're a simplistic, uh, straightforward uh, optimist, uh, would say been done. Uh, screen for hep C one time. You don't have to know ages or cohorts or anything. And uh, if it's positive, uh, treat. And uh, you don't need to know much. You'll achieve uh, treatment uh, eradication rate of 95%. Plus, I would say practically everyone gets cured nowadays. Uh, your only thing to figure out is to diagnose their degree of cirrhosis. And now you have fiber scans, so you also don't need to know much. Just fiber scan. If the reading is high, then HCC surveillance uh, every six months, whether it works or not, who knows. But but that's sort of the, the idea of HCV-related HCC. Now, now, this is clearly highly uh, optimistic because uh, there, there are a few issues remaining in HCV-related HCC. Uh, one of them is most people or a good chunk of people with hepatitis C still don't know whether they have hep C or not. They're undiagnosed. And if they're undiagnosed, they're unlinked and therefore they won't be treated or not. So uh, as you may know, um, President Biden's, uh, one of the early moonshots is going to be elimination of hepatitis C in the nation, uh, which highlights that there is still a problem, but that problem is not in inventing new medications or new diagnostic tests or knowing the epi. It's really uh, implementation of how do you screen people, confirm them, communicate the risk and eradicate them. So HCV related HCC while has dropped, is dropping, uh, is not completely gone for this one reason. There's another reason uh, which is there because or, or related to uh, the hepatitis uh, uh, C endemic, uh, sorry, the, the opioid endemic, uh, epi, yeah, uh, endemic, and especially in the Midwest, there is a resurgence of um, hepatitis C infections in younger people. Now, whether this is a flood of cases that is going to change the epi of hepatitis C or not uh, remains uh, to be known. Um, so I'm done with hepatitis C now. So hepatitis B, um, it's the main reason for hepatocellular carcinoma worldwide. And I'm going to paint an optimistic view of it. And I'm going to make the case that uh, the decline in hep C and in hep B related HCC is the explanation to my first two slides, which is why the incidence of HCC has declined globally. So uh, I think everyone in this crowd knows the story of hepatitis B vaccination, an amazing public health achievement. And uh, it's, a, it's one of those cancers that has been tightly linked to a reduction 
uh, a vaccine tightly linked to a reduction in cancer. The Taiwan experience, which they keep publishing on since their uh, uh, national vaccination program, they've shown progressively decreasing HCC in progressive cohorts, first in children, then adolescents, then young adults, and now in adults. So that's one thing. The other thing is, and this is while in an old study using an old medicine, lamavudine, treatment of those who qualify for treatment with hepatitis B and adequate viral suppression has been associated in multiple studies, this happens to be a randomized control study, with a reduction in the incidence of HCC. So a combo of vaccination and effective treatment uh, has led to a drop in uh, HCC. So where is the epi part remaining? Well, the epi part remains in the predictors of HCC among those who are in care, who are on treatments. Okay? That's where risk stratification remains. Uh, you'll be hard pressed seeing studies that predict HCC in active hepatitis B who are candidate treatments who are just left out without treatment. Well, that was the old days when most people were not getting treated. But now, if you're in care and you have you know, elevated uh, enzymes and or elevated HBV DNA, depending on whether you're an E antigen positive, negative, et cetera, uh, a, a big chunk of people will be on treatment. So what is left in the risk stratification is um, male more than women, um, older people, uh, diabetes, as Tim mentioned, with or without hepatitis B or C increases the risk. And then you notice this uh, wasteland here of things that occupied epidemiologists for a long time uh, that none of the risk stratification combos include anymore because everyone is on treatment and treatment affects all of those. So most of the risk stratification parameters do not include HBV DNA anymore or E antigen or ALT or alpha fetoprotein. And what remains is cirrhosis, uh, the degree of fibrosis, and then surrogates of synthetic function, if you will, like albumin and platelets. All of these uh, stratification have funny names that no one can remember, but, but they're listed here. And uh, what this table, which is for you to keep later, uh, shows you the different components, the variables that enter into these uh, risk scores. And in a way, it's the best summary for the, where the epi uh, or clinical epi of HBV-related HCC is. So if you want to be simplistic again, prevention of hep B is admittedly more complicated than hep C, but vaccination, all infants and children up to 18, adults in high-risk group, uh, then screening, and uh, screening the high-risk uh, still, there are no population based, at least in this country. Treat ineligible patients. Again, diagnose cirrhosis or advanced fibrosis. HCC surveillance in appropriate risk groups, which happens to be cirrhotics, uh, although some select group without cirrhosis would qualify to that. Uh, highly optimistic because the global goals of uh, elimination uh, uh, are still not achieved for, for multiple reasons. Uh, related to the uh, diffusion of vaccination, the uptake of vaccination, uh, and uh, the treatment uh, in eligible people. Which brings me to the next topic. Uh, it's, it's, as we call it, you know, first, first world problems, okay? So the first world problem here, uh, I'm going to talk about obesity, metabolic syndrome, uh, NAFLD. Um, I hope I left you with enough to ponder that hep C, uh, while we clearly have done a great job there, is not done. Hepatitis B, while the outline is there, is still a lot of it. And in my opinion, those two buckets, hep C and hep B, uh, are still low-hanging fruits for preventing hepatocellular carcinoma, as opposed to the high-hanging fruits that I will mention in the latter part of this talk. Uh, so what is the link of obesity to hepatocellular carcinoma? Uh, not a great one in the sense, not well-defined, 
uh, not very precise and not very consistent. Uh, so this is a meta-analysis of many other similar studies. And the slide is divided into two sections. The upper half correlates uh, uh, obesity as a risk factor for HCC. The bottom half, overweight. Both are measured by body mass index. And you can see that in the overweight, which is the bottom half of the slide, um, the risk is actually not elevated. It's barely above one, and the confidence intervals bridge the one. Uh, for obesity, it is significant, statistically significant, uh, but it's barely, it's one point something, and the studies are all over the place. So uh, obesity as a risk factor, it's, it's weak and it's inconsistent uh, risk for hepatocellular carcinoma. And, and why is that? I mean, maybe it's not a dangerous thing, but maybe we're just measuring the wrong things by focusing on body mass index uh, because uh, a body mass index uh, is, is what we call a distal association. It, it, it is removed from the relevant intermediate exposures slash pathogenic mechanism that is more tightly linked to HCC. And perhaps by focusing on those more proximal variables, one obtains a more consistent, relevant, and targetable uh, uh, association than BMI. So abdominal obesity is one such uh, variable. Humoral mechanism related to the systematic effect of uh, obesity, like adipokines and cytokines and things like that. Uh, the medications that are used for the metabolic syndrome, NAFLD, NASH, and perhaps genetic factors. I'll touch on some of those things. So this is the paper that uh, Tim was talking about. And ironically enough, I, I did this paper with um, uh, uh, Jay Everhart, who was at the NIDDK. Uh, he was the head of you know, EPI there, and I was a fellow. And because I programmed SAS, he heard about this guy who's a gastroenterologist who's also a programmer. And at the time there was phones, you couldn't email people. So he called me up and he said, my name is so-and-so. I'm also an epidemiologist. I have a, a, an idea. And his idea had something to do with viruses, not this study. And I would go to DC and I would sit with him. And Jay Everhart was the one who taught me Cox proportional hazard and how to do survival analysis on the VA database. So the trade-off was I do the programming and he teaches me the stats applied to the data set. And to this day, I really know how to do that stuff, thanks to Jay. So our more uh, uh, prominent paper with Jay was this study, which is a, a cohort study retrospective using VA databases, 173,000 patients with diabetes three times or so, uh, the number with no diabetes, looking at the incidence of HCC over time up to 12, 13 years. And it shows a doubling of the HCC incidence among those with diabetes compared to those without. Subsequent to that, and I know this slide says 18 studies, but I think by last count, 26 or so uh, cohort studies from all over the world uh, came up more or less with the same conclusion and more or less with the same point estimate, which is two. So two, whether it's a relative increase of two, which is eh, modest, uh, absolute risk. You can see it on the y-axis, very small, the way it affects uh, individual people. So that's one surrogate for diabetes. And it shows perhaps more consistent association than BMI. Several studies, Europe and the US recently, but, but Europe multiple studies have examined waist hip ratio in population-based studies and showed two to three times uh, or folds increase in the risk of HCC in those in the highest tertile of waist hip ratio compared to those in the lowest. More consistent, more precise, and higher association than that noted with BMI alone. Uh, the joke does not work at all. I usually say this is me before or after my weight loss, but since you can only see my face here, it's not even funny, but I'm going to leave it here. Um, so I talked about diabetes, talked about waist hip ratio. Now I'm in the context of proximal associations as opposed to a distal BMI association. The third and, and 
you know, a very important one that may mediate what happens between obesity and, and uh, HCC is NAFLD. Uh, you're familiar with the trajectory, uh, lots of NAFLD, few HCCs, but such a, a transition has been described. While it has been described, I, I'm proud to say, I think our study in the US at least is one of the few studies that takes this concept from the beginning. Is NAFLD a risk factor for HCC in a cohort study, as opposed to case control and cross-sectional, which flooded the market? So in this study of almost half a million patients, again, identified in the national VA data sets, compared to another half million without NAFLD, all defined, by the way, based on uh, elevated ALT. This is not imaging, and it's not fibroscan, and it's not stuff, shows sevenfold increase in the risk of HCC in all comers with NAFLD to controls. Um, a few things worth pointing out, because that's really the gist of what I'm going to say about the changing epi, is, is the, 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 di the, the, the discrepancy between relative risks and absolute risk. So relative risk, it just shows this is really a risk factor. And, and it's an impressive number to say. But look at the number of people who actually developed liver cancer in all comers of NAFLD. 87 out of half a million. Uh, it's a, uh, uh, sorry, NAFLD, 727 out of half a million. Still a very small number over a mean follow-up of 10 years. So to cut to the chase, risk stratification, figuring out who are the groups to focus on when you have a risk factor that is that common is really where the field is moving and should move even further uh, to figure out how to translate epi into clinically meaningful, actionable points. So this is an important study, proof of concept, risk cancer is elevated, but boy, the absolute risk is small. Not only there's this study, there are reports now sprouting from all over the world that say out of newly diagnosed HCC, we're finding small or sometimes intermediate, or in many places they say even large proportion of HCC where the underlying risk factor is NAFLD or NASH. Um, a prominent uh, country or region here uh, is the Indian subcontinent. Um, they happen to be correlationally here. Uh, having one of the higher prevalence rates of severe insulin resistance, not necessarily related to obesity, but few other red hot spots uh, around the world. So putting it there together, uh, I want to impress upon you the issues of the changing epi. And this is a, a useful slide. Uh, and humor me, but follow with me, please. Uh, there's the risk factor, hepatitis B, hep C, alcohol, metabolic, MAFLD, or NAFLD, depending on how you call it. There's the prevalence of the risk factor in the population. So hep B, and I'm using US estimates, is really not that common. 0.5% is, is an exaggeration. In some studies, it's 0.4%. But the relative risk of HCC, meaning if you have active hepatitis B, your risk of developing HCC is really elevated. I mean, the cohort studies show 20 to 25-fold elevation. Then you get to population attributable fraction. If you're a public health person, this is the number where you say, if I wipe out hep B from the population, how much of a proportion of hepatocellular carcinoma will I get rid of? You have a rare or an infrequent exposure, but a very virulent one, uh, you can get rid of five to 10%. How about hep C? Slightly more common, equally virulent. Uh, let's give it 20 to 25%. Metabolic syndrome, diabetes, obesity, NAFLD, MAFLD, very, very common, 30 to 40%. All the studies that I've shown you are really puny association, 1.5 to 2. But you could rack up a lot of population attributable fraction by having even a weak risk factor that is very common. So how are things changing? Well, the prevalence in the general population of hep C and hep B is dropping. Uh, a combination of vaccine and treatment for hep B, screening detection and treatment for hep C, 
the risk estimate of HCC is dropping to the degree that I showed you that slide. Apart from cirrhosis, there isn't much left for hep C. And in hep B, there isn't much left either. So those who are treated, the risk of HCC in them is declining. So the combo means that the population attributable fraction in the population for hep C and B is, is gone down and going down. What is going up is the metabolic syndrome replacing sort of those two factors, not at the same speed. And that's why HCC incidence has been declining because uh, you're not going to replicate uh, the hep C cohort uh, affecting a specified cohort, high prevalence, high risk, remaining for 20 to 30 years without treatment. Um, we're still not there in the metabolic syndrome. So, so this is my contribution to art and, and models. Uh, so the previous state, very low prevalence, very high risk. Future state, uh, very high prevalence, very low risk, which really makes HCC risk stratification no longer a luxury but uh, for epidemiologists, but a necessity if we're going to have things that are relevant uh, for clinical practice. Uh, risk stratification, as you know, have too many people with chronic liver disease like NAFLD, um, something that would give us HCC risk assessment. We'd be able to stratify people into high risk uh, that would undergo whatever it is that we do, uh, more intensive screening, more intensive management, more intensive weight loss, perhaps newer medications, and then lower risk that perhaps would be spared those interventions. So where are we in this HCC risk stratification? And this is really the focus of our current epidemiological study efforts. So in that study that I've shown you, the seven-fold increase in the risk of HCC among uh, the half a million veterans with NAFL compared to half a million without veterans, we asked the question, well, who else or in this group, what are the subgroups that are a higher risk? So those were the incidence of HCC is on this axis. And these are the factors. Presence of diabetes, older age, Latinos, and Fib4, which is a reflection of fibrosis. And the highest is NAFLD with cirrhosis. So that is one subgroup or stratifier of NAFLD that seems to be actionable. Advanced fibrosis slash cirrhosis gets you a high enough HCC risk that you need to identify them, screen them, survey them, management, do whatever you want to do with them. What else? Accumulation of metabolic dysfunction traits gets you up to a certain degree where, not yet, but it's close to being clinically actionable. So diabetes and hypertension gives you two elevation and hazard ratio. If you add to that, dyslipidemia gets you up to three. If you add this with an obesity, it gives you around six or so. So a promising tool for risk stratification is the quantification and the identification of metabolic risk factors. What else? Treatment turns out to be an important determinant of risk within those who, with, with NAF. So metformin alone, as opposed to metformin with uh, uh, insulin or other things, is associated with a decreased risk of HCC among those with NAFL and naturally diabetes. Those who have insulin in any shape or form um, are at a higher risk than, than the others. Having diabetes that is prolonged or not controlled, or having lots of pathies, so diabetic complications as nephropathy, neuropathy, all the pathies, is associated with a higher risk of HCC. Having diabetes, which is relatively well controlled, as defined by hemoglobin A1c, less than 7, 80% of the follow-up time is a good indicator. Can these things be used for risk stratification? Uh, possibly. I mean, possibly the HbA1c. Uh, no one has done this to be clinically actionable, but here I'm just reviewing with you what is the epi yielding in terms of risk stratification that could be clinically useful? What about statins? 
very commonly used in those with a metabolic syndrome. Um, again, national VA data sets, I, I believe this is the first study that looked at statin and HCC in a US population. And we've shown that it's inversely associated with the risk of hepatocellular carcinoma. And multiple other studies have shown similar findings, uh, possibly in certain subgroups of statins, but not the others. Uh, and it's serious enough that the NIH now has a randomized control trial of using statin in patients with cirrhosis to reduce bad outcomes with HCC as one of them. So, uh, you know, people make fun of epi sometimes, but I mean, this is something without having a credible epi uh, solid background behind it, uh, we probably have never progressed to a randomized control trial. PNPLA3, um, as you know, isolated from GWASs have been linked with the prevalence of NAFLD uh, uh, teleologically increasing uh, hepatic uh, uh, fat, uh, fat levels and ALT uh, by a mechanism not necessarily associated with the BMI insulin resistance and plasma triglycerides. Multiple studies have examined uh, the bad homozygous variant of PNPLA3 polymorphism and shown that in Caucasians particularly, uh, there is a risk, uh, an increased risk 2.74 or so uh, of developing HCC. Can this be a risk stratifier? Well, there are multiple studies and others ongoing to take the, uh, uh, the multiple uh, gene variants that have been associated either with an increased risk or a decreased risk of NASH cirrhosis HCC in that continuum, putting them in a polygenic risk score where uh, each of these genes, depending on how many hits do you get of the bad or the good variants, you get a score, and that score is a mathematical score and can be used for risk stratification. There's such a study. So four of the, of the common gene polymorphisms that have been uh, all uh, found in different GWASs, PNPLA3, uh, TM6F2, uh, MBOT7, uh, uh, GCKR, and HS17B13. Uh, uh, polygenic risk score, the high PRS is associated with two to three fold elevation in the development of fatty liver, two to three fold elevation in the development of cirrhosis in those with fatty liver, and one and a half to two fold increase in the risk of HCC in those with cirrhosis. Well, we recently completed a, a study from the UK Biobank, uh, and I think this is a, as good as one can use perhaps uh, for uh, current risk prediction uh, in, in, in a clinical context. Uh, we examined the joint effect of PNPLA3 variant, uh, homozygous, meaning uh, the bad variant, if you will, looking at two common exposures. That's where you really need risk stratification, obesity and alcohol intake. This is a general population, not even a cirrhosis population. And three sets of data here, excessive drinkers with obesity, only excessive drinkers, or only obese. Each one of those is, we look at it as PNPLA3 non-carrier, the good kind, if you will, which is in the green, heterozygous, which is in the red or orange, homozygous for PNPLA3. And basically, this last one, which is excessive drinkers who are obese, who have the PNPLA3 homozygous mutation, have an increase of, um, or have an incidence rate of 2.16% over 10 years. That's a real number, okay? It's not real enough to qualify to screening guidelines, which is 1% per year, but you can see that this line of thinking has potential. So perhaps if combined with, you know, Asian ethnicity and diabetes and something else, uh, you would get to a risk stratification model that functions, that uses at, at variables from different domains. So I'm 
personally excited about this as a, as a line of research. Uh, so what are the current risk prediction models in NAFLD NASH? Uh, they're mostly you know, very basic and elementary. Uh, I'm not gonna go through the details of what these models do, uh, but it, they're slightly better than Gestalt, but not by a whole lot. So age, sex, etiology, platelets, age, diabetes, race, etiology, sex, PNPLA3, here's one, uh, F3, F4, uh, age, sex, etiology, platelets. I mean, I'm a practicing hepatologist. That's how I think. I mean, you're, you're old, you're heavy, you're overweight, platelets, uh, your risk is somewhere intermediate, fine, we'll do screening or not. This is not very sophisticated. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, so now my last part is, how does this tie to our current research? Well, I reside in the great state of Texas, and the great state of Texas has the highest rates of HCC incidents in the nation. So the top three lines here are incidence rates in different groups in Texas. The very top line is Latinos in Texas. The bottom three lines are the national statistics. To put it bluntly, Latinos in Texas have four to five times, I believe, the overall rate that is national. And Latinos in South Texas border counties have even higher than that, puts them at rates that are similar to some parts in China. So it's a good time to do, because there's a lot of focus to do HCC research. So there is an entity in Texas called the Cancer Prevention Research Institute of Texas, uh, secret otherwise, uh, funded us in 2017 to establish a prospective cohort of patients with cirrhosis. We chose cirrhosis because if we choose the general population, HCC remains way too rare to study. Cirrhosis is a detectable lesion, and the incidence, while high, not that high, it's only you know 2 to 3%, you still need lots of risk stratification within it. And we collect them at baseline. We obtain samples, which includes uh, germline DNA, serum, plasma, whole blood, nowadays even toenails for uh, heavy metal exposure. Uh, we get them as part of clinical practice. Those are all liver clinics every six to 12 months where we get imaging and repeat stored blood tests. And this is our total accrual uh, as of April, 2022. As you may have known, this is the map of Texas. Uh, we have sites in Houston. We have a couple of sites in Dallas. We have a site in San Antonio and a sign in a site uh, in McAllen, which is right on the border uh, down down in the valley. Um, these are the names of the sites: uh, three one four zero, which is now higher by it's around thirty four hundred uh, patients have been enrolled uh, in whom. I believe 160 uh, have developed liver cancer, HCC, during follow-up. So who are those people? And, and in a way, it's a test of what I just told you over the past 30 minutes. Has this NAFLD, NASH thing dominated the horizon? Is it really hepatitis C and hep B are no longer dominant players? Mind you, those are liver clinics. This is not primary care. This is not population. This is like where people come to see the specialist. And this is uh, the first, I believe, 1,500 enrolled. Um, this is the etiology of cirrhosis in, in this group. 33% um, had cured hep C. 30% have alcohol, moderate to heavy. 23% have NAFLD. 16% had active hep C on their first visit but by first year of follow-up, none had hep C and only 2.5% would have hep B. If you're a believer in the so-called MAFLD, metabolic associated uh, fatty liver disease, as opposed to NAFLD, which requires exclusion, three quarters of patients with cirrhosis in Texas have MAFLD. That's a, that's a huge deal. And what is happening to HCC in this group? Again, preliminary study from the first uh, 2,733 patients. A uh, few observations. HCC still develops, uh, but to the chagrin of researchers, but to the happiness of patients, the incidence of HCC in cirrhosis has dropped. When we designed the study, we said 3% per year. Everyone talks about that. Heck, in Japan, they say 5% per year. 
In our study, it's 1.82, which means what we thought was a seven-year study, fortunately, got funded by the NIH for five more years in order to make it a 10-year study in order to get enough numbers of HCC to study. So number one, the incidence of HCC in this group of NAFLD MAFLD is lower than what we're used to, which makes it even more confusing how to risk stratify. Stewart Hep C even had higher rates than uh, NAFLD fibrosis. So we're now into creating adaptive risk stratification model. Uh, we think there's a basic model for everyone, could be populated by electronic health records, that would include demographics, routinely obtainable labs, clinical factors. Then if people have money and more resources, then they get a biomarker and then maybe stack genetic factors. And now we're looking at radiomic features as possibly something to stack on the model. The crucial thing that we're trying to do here is unlike people who just wanna publish the paper to say, oh, we have this biomarker and it predicts the risk of HCC. We want to show, does any biomarker offer a real advantage above age, sex, alcohol, cirrhosis, et cetera? Is there an incremental discrimination value or not? I'll give you a flavor of what we're looking at. Uh, so the first thing is we looked at the polygenic risk score. These are the four genes I talked about. We did the score. It's from zero to eight. Uh, the follow-up is around 5,000 patient years. We examined the 93 patients with HCC, and what it shows is those on the highest tertile of the polygenic risk scores have two-time elevation in the risk of HCC in cirrhosis compared to those on the lowest tertile, and it performs especially well in non-Hispanic whites, and it gives us a small incremental value over the model that doesn't have genes. If you're a glass half empty, you would see all of this time and effort to give us a C statistic from 0.68 to 0.7. Uh, if you're an optimist, you would say, we'll take any win um, and call it a day. What we're really doing is to say, proof of concept, this is good. This is a small study where our final sample size is going to be 300. And this is a partial list. So now we're getting into all the hits that showed up on other GWASs, expanding the polygenic risk score and seeing if it works better or not. We also, we're calling it metabol metabolomics, but it's really uh, biomarkers that have been tested in other studies individually and has shown promise. We started with a list of 39 biomarkers published in the literature that showed some association or risk stratification ability to cirrhosis. And we filtered it down uh, uh, bioinformatically uh, to nine biomarkers. And these are they, uh, IGF-1, interleukin-10, uh, macrophage uh, stimulating protein uh, alpha chain, uh, latent transforming growth factor B, tumor necrosis factor, adipsin, interleukin 1B. I mean, the good news is all of these names are, are within the ballpark. I mean, they're not too crazy. And what they show, this is the PBM9, which is the nine panel, increases the risk by almost three times, not shown on this slide, independent of the clinical and demographic risk factors and adds yet another three to 4% to your AURC. So we have the basic, we have the genetic, and we have uh, the biomarkers. Now, one what would hope eventually that these risk stratification models would include other aspects, multi-dimensions that represent different uh, parts of the elephant that is called progression from cirrhosis to HCC. Uh, and we're in different stages of these things. And obviously, I, I was talking to some of you today. Uh, this is where, where collaboration uh, hopefully would work. I mean, if, if there is something that, that really has shown promise as a biomarker for risk stratification and early detection, I think our study uh, or our cohort uh, could be a nice uh, place to test that. So I want to end here. Um, HCC incidence is declining. 
It's a reflection of less active hep B and hep C, more people living with cured hep C or suppressed hep B. There is now more NAFLD, MAFLD, whatever you want to call it, and alcoholic liver disease, which means we'll be dealing with a lot more people with the underlying risk factor whose risk for developing HCC has plummeted, which makes it imperative that we develop risk stratification. In the metabolic syndrome world, the relative risk, while impressive, and I can show you two times, three times, seven times, the absolute risk is low to make these things actionable yet. The main risk factors uh, still uh, are somewhat elementary, but useful, like advanced fibrosis and cirrhosis, uh, we're working, as well as others, on factors influencing the HCC risk that could be incorporated in the main risk stratification, age, abdominal obesity, diabetes, genetics, uh, biomarkers, et cetera. Uh, thank you very much again, and I would welcome any questions. Thank you. That's very <clears throat> good. Somebody has to allow us to get videos. I can't use my video. I don't know why. Uh, yeah, I, I was, I was, oh, there it is back. I, I was dreading someone would say you're on mute for the past 40 no. minutes. No. <laughs> yeah, please, uh, please, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm muted the uh, camera also. Right. This is actually, I should not be blocked it, but anyway, uh, if you don't mind if I ask a question. Sure, go ahead. Well, thank you so much, uh, Hashim. This is a fantastic, Some someone, uh, probably not, not me, but maybe me, we always think that um, uh, the epidemiology is kind of like a, less exciting or, or boring uh, but but your presentation always uh, so exciting but anyway uh, I, I have uh, one question um so uh, this is related to NAFLO we, you know NAFLO is about 20 25 percent of people have NAFLO but m most of people say with NAFLO have nothing you know there's no risk they are fine you know with a small fraction of those but the the risk allele you 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 show those are related to NAFLO but the small percent of people who actually progressively to uh, NASH eventually, and those are the people that have a problem. What, what are current status? What, what are the studies that actually demonstrate that, or at least the risk uh, stratification that allow you to study the NASH? Yeah, uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very legitimate question, uh, which is uh, most people with NAFL don't have, so the risk stratification uh, perhaps uh, should start at somewhat earlier. Why, why risk stratify those who would develop HCC? It's really a rare event. And perhaps we should do the risk stratification for uh, identification of NASH. And what is the status of that? Good question. Uh, the, the factors that are predicting NASH are along the same flavor that I mentioned today, which is age, sex, metabolic, et cetera. But there is one thing uh, that predicts NASH that is now clinically actionable, which is the degree of fibrosis. So those who are not cirrhosis, but have advanced fibrosis are, uh, this is being used as a surrogate for risk stratification of NASH. Uh, the genetic variants, the risk allele, um, is, is, is certainly predictive, but uh, no one has sort of applied this and shown two things, that it predicts better than fibrosis or not. I think this is the dilemma in clinical practice. You could figure out things actually with cheap tools. Uh, so will adding the gene give you an additional benefit or this is just an expensive test that predicts the same thing? I don't know the answer to that, but it's a it's a testable hypothesis. The third one, I'll wrap up my answer. Uh, the, the, the big move in the field is how to implement even basic tools of risk stratification in a way in the general population or in primary care to allow easy identification and risk stratification where the group with a higher risk can go to clinical trial or hepatology. Um, this has not been done at all, actually, in primary care. I mean, how do you incorporate this in practice, in electronic medical record? Do you create reminders? Do you do AI? Do, don't know. We and others are working on those things, but, but that's my answer. So Mark, Mark Arney, I think, sent the Earth message very early. So you want to ask a question, Mark? 
Uh, thanks, Tim. Um, so Hashim, first, a uh, great talk. Thank you. And, uh, something that uh, surprised me in your talk uh, was that, um, you know, Blacks actually are protected against NASH, yet you showed us some data that uh, uh, obese Blacks um, seem to have uh, high rates of uh, HCC, at least in sub-Saharan Africa. We also know there's there's a lot of Hep B there as well. Um, so my question to you is, um, uh, do you think uh, these individuals uh, have other environmental risk factors that are predisposing them uh, to cancer, such as aflatoxin exposure, alcohol, maybe even Hep B, that are also contributing to this uh, higher risk? Or, or do you think it's only attributable to obesity? Yeah, no, I, I think it's a great question. And, and, uh, and uh, let me put it clearer. Blacks in the US, in, in my impression, in my studies and other people's studies, it's remarkable. While they have high prevalence of certain risk factors, so they had high hep C and they have high hep B and have alcohol. So when you look at liver cancer, you say, oh, there are a lot, blacks are disproportionately represented there. But if you look pound for pound out of 100 people, African-Americans with hep C, or with alcohol, or with NAFL, or with anything, they're at a risk, lower risk for developing uh, cirrhosis and HCC. To your point, they're really at a lower risk for developing NASH NAFL in the first place, and they have uh, less of the less favorable allele. So that is completely true, I think, in the US. What is the issue with Sub-Saharan Africa? I mean, I, I hate to do pedantics here. I mean, the studies are not fantastic in Sub-Saharan Africa. I mean, these are like case series on a good day. You have no idea what's the underlying population. Yeah. And, and But let's assume it is right. Uh, my explanation would be exactly what you said. I mean, this is, this is not just uh, an obesity thing. I mean, the, it's, it has to be environmental exposure uh, hepatitis B, aflatoxin, something. But I, I do have healthy skepticism of, of how well these other risk factors are captured in the sub-Saharan African study. I mean, they have a problem. They have hep hepatocellular carcinoma. They have hep B. It's legit to highlight as, as a problem, but I wouldn't take the, the, the risk factors too seriously there. Thanks. Jake? Yeah, hi, Hesham. Hey. Sorry, we didn't have a chance to catch up separately. But anyway, I just want to congratulate for a great talk. And also, it's Thank really you. wonderful you can set up this prospective cohorts and looking at ACC. I'm sure you're going to get a lot of valuable information from that. So my question for you is actually, we talked about this before. Since you have serial uh, imaging studies, have you ever thought about sort of applying artificial intelligence, machine learning to look at this prospectively to identify potential features. As you know, this has been used very effectively in screening for breast cancer using AI on mammography, et cetera. So have you thought about this? It could be a great opportunity because you have such a prospective follow uh, patients and with serial imagings and uh, whether there's any effort on your part trying to address this issue. So it's a great point and uh, also a plea if someone knows or thinks that they're experts in this, contact me. So we have two grants, one with MD Anderson looking at CT scans collected mm -hmm. at baseline and looking at uh, patterns uh, within the CAT scan using artificial intelligence that may predict the future risk of cancer. Um, and I could tell you the, the, the logistical issue is how do you get those damn images and put them in the cloud for someone who is outside the site to analyze them, particularly in a study that have five or six sites? Um, be that as it may, we, we finally pulled like a couple of hundred for uh, our collaborators to start identifying patterns. So that's one. Uh, the second one, as part of the our newly funded PO1, we have collaborators at the MGH and we're looking at ultrasounds, um, identifying patterns in uh, routinely available ultrasounds, uh, more deeper look at the distribution of fat, the amount of fat or fat things. We do not have one for MRI, although we have tons of MRIs. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it is uh, radiomics, if you will, uh, is something that 
we've got funded to do. I'm appreciating the potential, but I'm also appreciating the difficulty of just how to do those studies. And I would welcome again uh, afterwards anyone who have ideas uh, on how to do this better. Great, thanks. Thank you. Okay, so uh, last question for uh, Dr. Mohan. Hi. Um... I'm Cecilia and I work uh, with uh, Dr. Gretton here at NCI. Thank you so much for the talk. It was very, very interesting. Um, I just had a quick question since um, you have the privilege of seeing all of this, all of these Hispanic patients in, in Texas. And um, uh, this is a question of either, you know, research that you've done or that you you may think of doing. Uh, do you see uh, very big differences in between uh, ATC incidents in Hispanics that were born in Mexico and then moved to Texas and there are those that are that were born in in Texas yeah uh, great question uh, it's higher in those who are born in Texas actually which is not perhaps what initially I would have thought but but yes it is uh, new, uh, newly born first generation basically born in at the border uh, don't know why uh, I mean, one could hypothesize many things, but uh, the the influx of so so while we're on the topic, I mean, there's an unfortunate confluence of three known things, and perhaps few other things that we don't know. Um, it's the obesity, uh, it's the, the the pattern of obesity, which is this visceral obesity thing. Uh, it's alcohol, um, uh, and it's the PNPLA three. So putting this together, uh, McAllen, where our site is, is, is just an unfortunate disaster of NASH, NAFLD, cirrhosis, and liver cancer. Uh, what I don't know, which makes every sense, is, is environmental exposures, uh, change in something in the diet that results from immigrating, um, who knows? I mean, there are all kinds of things about arsenic and... I don't know. Uh, I'm sorry, it's a, it's a long answer. Uh, the short of it is yes, those born first generation uh, uh, seem to be at a higher risk. And, and it's actually Mexican. So we collect the ethnicity and all of those. And yes, most Latinos in Texas happen to be Mexican, but not all. Uh, and, and it seems like it's the, it's the Mexican Latinos that are especially at a higher risk of HCC. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, <clears throat> we are past the hour. Thank you again. You know, just thank you, everyone. As a feedback, you know, we we had ninety listeners to your talk. I know it, you you one seems to sit in their own office and you don't notice this, but you know, this was um, certainly a highlight um, for our series. And um, thanks so much um, for giving this very very interesting presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. <laughs>